Welcome to lecture number one in the Atlas of Weak Signal Seminar. Uh, this is the first of five lectures and every day we're going to look at some of the systemic crises that are defining the challenges, the possibilities and the scenarios of how we will live and how the way that we do everything will change in the coming years. And the purpose of this series of lectures, as you know, is giving you the scope of research, giving you kind of like a cartography an atlas, if you will, of all the spaces where there are spaces of opportunity to look for weak signals, to try to determine where there can be interventions, whether through design, through politics, through changes and evolutions in social behavior to investigate. And it's unavoidable that in a way, the first place that we're gonna to have to look into is of course, the defining issue of our time. And we're going to look at this defining issue of our time from many multiple points of view. The first one has to do not with the reality of it, but how do we deal with it? How do we think about it? How do we keep on uh, living our daily lives with this huge fact and background happening behind us? And of course, this huge uh, uh, background is the planetary crisis. And we're going to tell this story in three parts. This is a work of art by one of the most uh, important artists in the world today, uh, Olaf Eliasson. He has presented it three times, one in Denmark, one in Paris during the COP24 uh, 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 climate summit in 2015, and more recently in London in 2018. Uh, what this a piece called Ice Watch is doing is bringing 12 pieces of ice from the Arctic, uh, 12 segments from a melting glacier, and putting it in front of you, letting you see it, letting you touch it, letting you, in a way, literally rubbing your nose against it. And what this piece, in a way, is doing is forcing you to think about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, you know, is this big, huge issue that it's in front of us, but we're trying to avoid and we try not to think about too much. Here, the elephant in the room is, of course, the melting ice. And more clearly also, your personal relationship with the melting ice, because there is a connection between you going through your everyday life, taking your uh, everyday decisions, and the fact that the ice is melting in the Arctic. So by confronting you with it, you have to recognize that this is part of the story of your life and that there is a relationship between this ice melting thousand kilometers away from your everyday routine and you and all of us in multiple ways. This is the massive demonstrations that Extinction Rebellion hosted in the UK one year ago in 2019. It's probably the first uh, big uh, protest that is trying to very specifically tell, point at the elephant in the room. And as you can see, it's a big pink boat in the middle of Oxford Circus in London with a sign on it. And the sign says, tell the truth. And what it means is that we all know, because we've been here for long enough, because we have read the newspapers, because we have followed the evolution of the crisis, that there is something going on that is going to determine our immediate present and the next few years, but most importantly, the, the lives of everyone that will come after us, both human and non-human. But we just don't want to talk about it. We recognize that it exists, we just don't know what to do with it. So sometimes we have to stop for a moment and think about it. So Extinction Rebellion are asking politicians to tell the truth. We also need to reflect about what is the truth. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. It's not going to be nice, but we have to go through it. Uh, I like reflecting about places that you may have never seen, but that actually have a very important uh, role in the history of knowledge and in, the, in and what we know about the world. And this building in Hawaii is actually one of them. This is the Manua Loa Observatory. Uh, this is the place where regular measurements of the concentration of CO2 on the air it started happening in 1958. Uh, the longest historical series of the proportion of CO2 in the air uh, has been measured from here for the last 60 years. And every morning we get a reading. 
And when we started in 1958, the reading was 315 parts per million. There was 315 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, things have changed a lot since 1950. Actually, they have changed increasingly and increasingly at a very fast speed. So what you're looking at is about the levels of CO2 concentration from the, from the last 400,000 years. Of course, we didn't have Manua Loa for 400,000 years, so we needed other ways of measuring the, the presence of CO2 in the air. We do it actually uh, by measuring it in air bubbles in the Arctic, in the, frozen in the, in the ice of the Arctic. We can point at the air and measure the concentration of the air and know that that was the air that humans were breathing 200,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago. And what we see is that something changed dramatically in around 1950. This is what's been called the the, the killing curve. It's a sudden spike in the proportion of CO2 concentration in the Earth, specifically if you look at it in the scale of geological time, not in the age of humans, but in the age of the planet. Something happened and exploded incredibly. This morning, every time that I think about this, I go to a website. You can look for it on Google and find it very easily to, to learn what was the reading in Manuel Observatory yesterday. Yesterday we had 411.29 parts per million. A few years ago, in uh, 2013, we crossed the threshold of 400 parts. Last year, we arrived at 415 parts, which is the historical record. Now, it's interesting to think about one fact. At the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution, the, the concentration of CO2 in the air was 280 parts per million. At some point in the last uh, three decades, we crossed the threshold that is considered to be safe, which is 350. And when we crossed the threshold of 400 parts per million, we actually started to breathe an air that was never breathed by humans before, because the last time this was a CO2 concentration uh, in the air, in the atmosphere, was four million years ago. So in a way, we are totally in uncharted territory no generation of humans had ever lived in the atmosphere that we are living today. And of course, this is having a huge impact. If you look at this chart, you can see how the global temperature has been rising for the last uh, 150 years, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, since we started burning coal, mostly, and putting all the CO2 that, that coal was producing up in the atmosphere, and of course, Later it was oil, then it was gas, on and on. What you're looking at the left part of the screen is the last 10 warmest years on record. This is the last, the warmest 10 years that have ever been recorded according to our measures. Now it's probably clear that something is going on. Uh, it's very obvious that something is happening because the five warmest years ever recorded were in this order 2016, 2019, 2015, 2017, and 2018. That is, the last five years. It's important to highlight that I'm not telling you nothing that you don't know about. You know all of this. But it's important to try to reflect what does it imply, what does it mean, the scale of this change, the fact of understanding that we are living under a set of conditions that neither of the previous generations of humans have lived. That the planet in which we're living and in which the rest of our lives will take place is a different planet than the planet in which our grandparents were born. And it will be a different planet in, the, in which your grandchildren will be born. Since we started measuring around the early 80s, late 70s, the amount of ice in the, in the Arctic, because we had satellites and then our satellites started to be able to measure the extension of ice in the Arctic. This has fallen up to 40% of its extension and 70% of its volume. Now, think about this again. What I'm saying and what scientists are telling us is that probably most of you were born in 1979. 1979 was three days ago in planetary uh, terms. In 1979, there was 40% more ice in the Arctic than today, in extension. 
but there was 70% more ice in Valium. In front of our eyes, at the click of a second almost, uh, the Arctic is going away. Scientists are calculating that we are basically losing around 10,000 tons of ice per second. And most importantly, most of the multi-year ice is gone. Most of the ice that was there forever has disappeared. The ice that we get is the ice that is uh, freezing every year with every season and then it starts melting in the summer. Some people are starting to think that probably we will get to see an Arctic without ice at some point between the next 20 and 40 years. But more things are happening. This is Sudan, you may have heard of him. I think it's an important character in a story. Sudan was the last of the male white northern rhinoceros. rhinos. Uh, out of the different species of rhinos, there is there's one specific one, the northern rhino, the white rhino, and there are two, var two, two varieties, there is the northern one and the southern one. Uh, Sudan died in 2018, being the last male member of its species. Uh, there are two females left, uh, Najin and Fatu. Uh, experts are trying to work with uh, insemination techniques to be able to keep the species going ahead. But what we're seeing is that the species are extinguishing or disappearing at, at the fastest rates that we've ever seen. We are in what is called the middle of the sixth extinction event. Uh, throughout the history of the planet, there has been five occasions in which the ratio of extinction of species have speeded up. Now we are in the sixth event and we have been the expansion of humans throughout the planet, the depletion of natural resources, uh, overfishing, uh, industrial agriculture, what is pushing more and more and more populations of species uh, to the extremes. Uh, it's incredible to think that throughout, it's estimated that if you look at non-domesticated wild mammals, uh, we lost around 70% of them, not in terms of species, but in terms of population numbers throughout the 20th century. So we seem to be heading to a much quieter planet, a planet that will be way less diverse in terms of life, way more quiet. Uh, man is Bernie Krause. He's one of the most well-known uh, acoustic biologists in the world. What he does basically is recording natural sounds in natural environments. And he has a huge archive where he can compare how was the sound of a forest 20 years ago uh, and how is the sound of that same forest today. And we're seeing again and again how forests throughout the world are becoming quieter and quieter as we are losing more and more of the species that inhabit them. And we are starting in a way to recognize that what is happening now in our lifetime with our generation of witnesses will be thought about and will be considered for many, many years to come as a turning point. Uh, in 2019, in the summer of 2019, uh, this sign was uh, installed in one of the melting glaciers in Iceland to commemorate the fact that we knew that this was a turning point, that we couldn't prevent the disappearance of this specific glacier. And that we're starting to wonder how generations of the future will think about us who are witnessing the biggest transformation of, of our lifetimes and of the planet's lifetime for many millions of years. The problem with climate change is that climate change is not just one thing. We don't really have an image of what it is. It is not only the polar bears in the Arctic trying to uh, survive in the melting ice. It is not only the disappearance of life in the forest, it is many, many things. Uh, philosopher Timothy Morton coined the term hyper-object to talk about events, about uh, phenomena that is too big and moves too slow for us to see. And climate change will be one of the quintessential examples of what is a hyper-object. It is just present in many small details, details of, the, of the way in which we live, we may not be perceiving it, but actually we are starting to realize that the planet in which we are and the planet in which we existed 30 years ago uh, are starting to diverge. That some memories that we have of the way that we live are starting to not be able to be reproducible because the underlying geophysical reality of the planet is changing fast enough 
that we get to see how it is evolving, but maybe not fa fast enough that we can point that, okay, this is climate change, this is climate change. It's complicated and we'll talk about it more. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects for the last few years. Uh, it won the big award at the Venice Biennale and it's actually an opera and the opera takes place on a beach and the people is sunbathing on the beach and the, the story is that everybody keeps on carrying with their lives as it is normal, but at some point something starts introducing themselves in the conversation, which is those small things that people don't want to talk about, but that are there. And, and, and what the piece is, of course, is about how do we think about something that is much bigger than us? How do we think and how do we speak about something that is going on in which we individually are not responsible, but collectively all of us are responsible? Uh, and also that connects us with the fate of future generations. We have started to exist in two temporal scales in a way. The temporal scales of our lives that only takes place in, you know, these time chunks of 80 years, of 70 years, of 90 years, if you are very lucky, that we have been given, but also in the time scale of the planet, in the way in which we have uh, created a series of e events that will transform the physical reality of the planet. And we're trying to think about our commitment, our obligations towards what will happen at that other scale. So the second part of this story is called the mutation. And the mutation is what we are seeing and we are starting in a way to witness. This is a geological chart of the life of the planet. This is basically a very well-known graphic that explains and tries to give you a sense of the different ages of the planet. How do we measure time and how we measure the ages of, of Earth uh, from the beginning of it according to the geological record. And if you look at the end of it, at the uh, lo lower uh, right corner, you will see that the last chunk is called the Holocene. The Holocene lasted for 12,000 years. In a way, the Holocene is the whole history of mankind. But we're starting to have enough signs to try to decide or to try to uh, uh, arrive to the conclusion that we are not in the Holocene anymore, that we actually enter a new period, a new age, in the geological age of the planet. And the people that were given the responsibility to take the decision is these guys, the Anthropocene Working Group, a uh, uh, research group with geologists from all over the world that were trying to reach the conclusion that we have enough uh, signs in the geological record that when geologists from the future start looking at these years, at the last 50 years, they will say, okay, something changed here. There is a sign in the geological record that says that the planet entered into a new uh, age. And this age is what we call the Anthropocene. The idea in the Anthropocene is the main agent of change in geological terms today is the action of men. That men moves and changes more sediments throughout the planet every year than all the geological processes created by the wind, by the tides, by the rivers, that 85% of the courses of the rivers have been changed by the action of men. Now, a lot of people are critical of this notion of the Anthropocene because what it's saying is that men, in abstract, is responsible for these changes. And what these critics are saying is that not all men have been equal in this. Not all uh, cultural uh, groups or classes. So they prefer talking about the idea of capitalism, saying that it's being the extractivist force of capitalism, the one who has changed and transformed the geological reality of the planet. So that, for instance, we cannot point at indigenous groups, we cannot point at underdeveloped nations and say you are as guilty of the Anthropocene as others. So not everybody loves this term. Other people talk about plantation thing because they say that in a way massive big scale uh, industrial agriculture uh, exemplified in the image of the plantation was the first agent that rearranged and that changed the reality of the planet through the men's action. But anyway, we will stick to the Anthropocene as a term that is useful for us to, to operate and to work. And of course, it's hard to think that you go to bed one day in the Holocene and then you wake up the next morning and you are already in the Anthropocene. It's, it's hard to make it like a straight line saying, okay, what is the moment at which one planetary age 
ended and the next one began. But actually, in a way, they did this. It's exactly what they did, because when they were trying to look for a sign or for one specific event that could create a threshold, they picked this one. Uh, July 16th, 1945, which was the day of the detonation of the Trinity nuclear test, the first ever nuclear detonation. And what geology says is that it will be very clear and very easy in the geological record to find a line that says, we started to find signs of massive radiation caused by the action of men from this point onwards. And this event will stay, uh, will be uh, measurable for many, many thousands of years. But actually the detonation of Trinity is also very convenient because it almost matches one important uh, series of changes that are starting around the early 50s that have been called the Great Acceleration. And the idea of the Great Acceleration is that if you measure at many, many different indicators from population explosion to uh, deforestation to use of natural resources to CO2 emissions, you see that around 1950 there is a spike and it increases radically. And the way of thinking about this and thinking about these realities is that if you think about the planet of 1950, there was 1,500 million of humans in the planet. If you think about the planet of today, there are 7,500 million of humans in the planet. There are estimations that will be 900 million, 9,000 million of humans in 2050. So it's clear that a planet that had to sustain 1,500 million people in 1950 has to be, and is very different from one that is doing more than triple the amount of uh, humans uh, uh, 60 years later. Another of the signs that uh, geologists say that will mark, uh, will define the appearance of the uh, Anthropocene, or that we enter into the Anthropocene, is the presence in the geological record all over the planet of bones of one specific bird. And this bird is the most common bird in the planet today, which once was only a bird that existed in Asia. And now it's really a bird that you will find absolutely anywhere. It is, of course, the domestic chicken. If you look at the geological record, you will find bones of domestic chicken all over the planet, starting in the 1950s. And this chicken is not exactly the same chicken that we had uh, taken originally. It has been modified for our purposes. It has been crossbred. It is a product of human uh, intervention. So you could say actually that this chicken, the domestic chicken, is a species from the Anthropocene. It's a species that didn't exist before. In a way, the planet in which we live today is a radically different planet than the planet in which our grandparents were living in 1950. It's as if we had taken a rocket, we had gone to another planet, like in Planet of the Apes, and then at the end of the story we discover that we're actually in the same planet from which we departed. It's just that it has changed radically. Philosopher of science Bruno Latour called this the mutation. The awareness that we have undergone and that we have made the planet go through a radical transformation that affects many systems. And if you go to look for signs of the mutation, we can find many of them in many different ways. And I'm going to just show you a few of them. Uh, this is the work of uh, Singapore artist Charles Lim. I think his work is very interesting to try to understand something that is very relevant. Uh, his work uh, deals with sand and with terraformation. How have we actually, through the hands of men, moved so many millions of suns in the planet that we have actually reshaped, or what they call sometimes terraform, complete parts of the planet. And, and in his work he talks about Singapore, which is a very small nation, very rich, uh, that has a very important problem, which is that it has run out of space. It has very, very little space. Uh, so in the last 60 years, it has started a very intense process of proclamation of uh, creating artificial land and then expanding the size of the country by taking land from the sea. Of course, we do this everywhere. Here in Barcelona, you will come go to many places where actually you are on land reclaimed by the sea. But it has never been done on a scale like Singapore does. Right? More than 25% of the surface of Singapore is land reclaimed to the sea. This has made uh, Singapore 
the biggest buyer of sand in the world. And sand is the second community in terms of trading in the world after water. So if you go there, in many occasions, you will be actually walking over the sea with land that has been moved from all over the world. You are seeing the process of how it is to make land. In this video, you're seeing if we're going to be making land, how does it look like? How, how the process by which uh, big, huge ships move sand from all over the world, come here and then create these huge uh, uh, areas where water is pumped out of the sea and then it's replaced by, by sand. How does it become a process of conquering the sea? But actually, in a way, ironically, uh, Singapore is in the equator and the equator, of course, is the most seriously affected uh, area of the world by sea level rise. So as global warming becomes worse, the ice melts, the level of the sea rises, uh, and the first land that will be reclaimed by the water will, of course, be the reclaimed land. So in a way, if you want to see like a image or like a perfect picture of the conflict between capitalism and the planet, this is it. The process by which men try to reclaim land from the sea and the sea is trying to reclaim it back. Artist Tomas Araceno has been mapping the shape of the clouds and actually has been helping us to identify that because of uh, aerosol emissions and of course and the changes of the dynamics of the atmosphere, we have new kinds of clouds, clouds that didn't exist before, that have been created by the action of man. So we are starting to affect the same shapes of nature. Or we are finding new kinds of minerals. Of course, there is one artificial mineral in the planet that has taken over the whole planet. It is plastic. Plastic is everywhere. Plastic is at the bottom of the sea. It's in the water that we drink. We have a huge problem with the way water has become part of the food chain and it appears in the stomachs of almost any animal. Geologist Charles Moore and artist Kelly Jasvag have been mapping the appearance of this material that they call plastic glomerates. These are rocks that appear in beaches in different parts of the world. Uh, and the thing about this is that they are almost an indistinguishable fusion of molten plastic with other kinds of sediments. So these rocks are part nature, part culture, part the action of man, part the natural underlying reality of the planet. And in a way, this is the defining image of the Anthropocene, that we cannot create a line splitting the action of man and the underlying geological realities of the planet anymore, because the biophysical, and the political are fusing in ways that make it very hard to separate one from each other. The way that this is also changing artificial constructions that only exist in culture is really fascinating. Italian design studio Studio Folder has been researching how, and this is, I love this project because I think it's really, really interesting. The border in the Alps between Italy and Austria is moving. And it is moving because with the uh, disappearance of the snow and the ice, the shape that traditionally had been recorded in the mountain to define where one country ends and the other begins has been shifting because the shape of the, of the snow has been sh changing throughout the last few years. The same fact that something as artificial as a political border is being reshaped by how the planet is changing underneath our feet, it's a very powerful image, I think. If we think about monuments for the Anthropocene, icons that in a way represent or show very clearly how we have been moving from one geological age to the second, uh, I think this will be it. This is a project by, by artist Trevor Paglen called the Trinity Cube. And the Trinity Cube is a glass cube that is sitting in Fukushima, in the Fukushima Exclusion Zone. That is inside the perimeter of the, created by the uh, Fukushima nuclear uh, plant explosion. So you cannot go to see it. And it's a cube of uh, glass. The glass was taken there, so it's radioactive glass uh, that are remnants of the explosion. And inside of it, it includes one mineral. This mineral is called trinitite. And if you have any kind of interest in collecting stones or are interested in, in rock collections, you may have heard of trinitite because it's a very particular and very specific uh, kind of mineral. In a way, it was the first mineral of the Anthropocene and the first mineral created by men. Trinitite are the rocks that still preserve levels of radioactivity that were produced by the explosion, the detonation of the Trinity test in July 1945. 
Uh, it's very expensive in the collection market and there are many fake examples of it. But basically what Trevor Paglen did in this project was taking the material of the first explosion uh, of the nuclear age produced by men, put it inside a container of glass inside the last nuclear disaster that connects in way one with the other. This is in a way like the final market of how the action of man has transformed the underlying reality of the planet in the Anthropocene. So, now that we have talked about what is the truth, now that we are trying to understand how it's changing things in geological uh, scales, the question of course is what now? What is the plan? How are we thinking about going ahead in this process? How are we thinking about moving forward, uh, looking at the scale of this huge crisis that is unraveling in front of our eyes and that is defining and shifting the course of many generations to come? What are we going to do about it the years that we have left? Well, if you have the question of what is the plan, there is no more defined plan than the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 by 193 nations in the world, uh, and its committee has to one specific scenario. Uh, you know about it, but it's, it's good to try to remember what are the numbers. The scenario is that at some point in the last part of the 21st century, that is, at some point between 2050 and 2100, the amount of CO2 that we can burn and put in the atmosphere has to be zero. We have to stop releasing CO2 in the atmosphere forever. And all the oil that is left, all the gas that is left, all the coal that is left will have to stay in the ground. We are doing this because it seems to be the only chance that we have to prevent that the rise of global temperatures over the levels of 1850, over the pre-industrial levels, rises ideally more than 1.5 degrees and definitely no more than 2 degrees. As of today, in 2020, we are in 1.1 degrees of rise of average temperatures through the levels of 1850. And if we do nothing, we seem to be headed to a scenario of between 3.5 and 4 degrees of increase, which would be catastrophic from many perspectives. Now, in order to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, which are not going to be easy to agree, in which we are not still doing great, uh, we have to start a radical process of decarbonizing the economy and changing every aspect that we can think of that make us put CO2 in the atmosphere. So it has to do with mobility, it has to do with the shape of cities, it has to do with what we eat, it has to do how do we travel throughout the world, it really very much affects every dimension of the way in which we live. So it will not be an easy process. It's not as easy as just using renewable energies, although obviously they are a part. It will just not work out with changing every normal car with an electric car. It's gonna take a radical redefinition of how we think about the ways that we live. And I think that the, pro the problem that we have is that this exercise of projecting ourselves into the future is very much conditioned by the narratives that we have about how this future can be. We are working with those scenarios and this is the vocabulary that we have. So we tend to either think in terms of a green utopia, of green dense cities, uh, garden cities in which we move by bike, where we buy local, full of uh, grown organic farms, and this seems to be the green utopia that we have been promised. Or we can only think in terms of a post-climatic apocalypse, of a fight for the resource, for every last resource uh, on Earth, of a collapse of society that leaves us fragmented and in a permanent uh, fight for our lives. And it's likely not going to be either one or the other. Now, we're not going to try to make an exercise of prediction because one thing that we're going to do, that we want to do in this uh, master is not to predict. It's, it's not the way that, that, that we're going to help us in terms to think about it. But what we are seeing is that the way that we look about it and the way that it's been pre presented and discussed includes more a scenario than just a green utopia or a post-apocalyptic dystopia. So it's nice to investigate them a little bit further. So on one level we have what you could call like the capitalist green future, which basically, almost the way that it presents it is, this is an unfortunate technical problem. We did something wrong that was burning a lot of CO2 uh, using uh, fossil fuels that created this problem 
but this is just a technical problem, so if we replace it by renewable energies that will just allow us to replace normal cars with electric cars, that's it. It's basically, we don't have to think about living in a different way. Now, the problem with this scenario is that the numbers do not add up. This is not a problem of just replacing gas with renewable energy produced uh, by wind or solar. It is a problem that deals about what we eat and how we eat it. It is a problem that deals with how we move around the world. It is a problem that is with the uh, consumer culture in which we operate, in which things are disposable. We need to think in terms of reshaping and reimagining our relationship with goods, with services, even with the shapes of families or the shapes of society. It will just not work if we just think about it in terms of uh, any kind of solution is the same kind of world in which we live today, but only using renewable energies. So the right question is not how will the city be if every car has been replaced by an electric car, but how will the city be if the car is not anymore the center of the way cities are shaped? And this is the only way that we can think about the future of the city, for instance. I would say that this is like the most tame, the most uh, the less radical a scenario, this will be the most radical one. The most radical one is almost the one that says that it's too late, there's nothing that we can do. Uh, we basically run out of options, there's no way, things are way worse than we uh, acknowledge and we are on the verge of collapse and we are heading towards the collapse. So we might as well say our goodbyes, everything has a beginning and has an end, the planet will go on, we may not go on with it, or only a few will, because of course extinction for humans is not going to be easy, there's a lot of us, but basically it's almost the extinction its position. Now, I think this is interesting in philosophical and moral terms. Why should we not give up? Why giving up is not an option? And I almost leave for anyone to say, but I will say that for the purposes of this uh, master, and of this seminar and for the rest of our lives, let's keep on thinking about things we can do instead of reaching the conclusion that there's nothing that we can do. Although, as a provocation, I may have a respect for the people who reach the conclusion everything has a beginning as an end, why don't we start thinking that this is the end and it's okay, there's nothing else to do about it. The opposite radical uh, a scenario is almost what is called accelerationism. Uh, and basically what accelerationism says is that if we have reached this impasse because of our direct, radical, extreme intervention in the way natural systems work, we don't need less intervention, we need more of it. The way that we can actually change this is by tweaking more, is by intervening in a different direction, but with the same strength in the way that the planet operates. And this is, for instance, the position of what is called uh, geoengineering. Geoengineering is the set of technologies that have been considered uh, that include trying to reduce the amount of radiation of the sun over the planet or trying to reduce the acidity of the seas by making radical interventions uh, using technologies that are emerging. So for instance, spreading aerosol on the, on the cloud surfaces so that more sun will bounce back or releasing huge amounts of iron in the, in the ocean because we know that that reduces the acidity of the ocean. There's only one problem, or at least two problems, with the geoengineering approach. One is that we cannot really rehearse it. There is no dress rehearsal for geoengineering because we only have one planet and the, way, and the and climate is a global uh, uh, system. We cannot parcel and say, we will intervene on the sky, but only on this tiny piece of the sky. And if it doesn't work, it's okay, because the rest of it is fine. If we do it, we don't have a rehearsal. We just go and do it. And also, we don't have any kind of political structure for deciding how to do it. Who decides that we should intervene on the atmosphere? Who decides that we should intervene in the uh, ocean at that big scale? So, at the moment, the scientific community is extremely wary of thinking that we, have to, that we can go the route of accelerationism. And of course, there is another radical vision, which is this planet is over, let's go and look for the next one. So there is the illusion that the future of the uh, species will have to take place in another country, so we can start going to all of the other ones, so we might as well start going to Mars. Now, I am very suspicious about the fact that some of the people promoting these ideas are some of the richest people in the world with more disposable income. And I think these people are going to be fine. The problem is not for them to be fine. The problem is how we will keep uh, 2,500 million people in the planet living under livable conditions. 
and we don't know how to keep one single human alive on the surface of Mars for one week. So it's going to take much longer than this to try to think that we can give away this planet. For the moment, we are stuck in what the ecological movement says of having no planet B. This is the only planet that we have. And now, of course, there is the scenario of decreationism. Decreationism uh, is basically saying, or degrowth, degrowth is saying that we will have to do more with less, that we will just have to use way less resources, that we will have to just change the amount of uh, uh, resources that we each of us consume so that the future is decoupling progress from the idea of growth. And we can sympathize with this and we can feel that it is right, but it, there are a lot of unanswered questions. We know what a planet of 1,500 million people require and the growth into the state of our world in 1950 could have been easier if we don't had this small fact that now humankind is four times uh, bigger. That we have to think about not in terms of how we go back, but how we go forward thinking in new ways and actually de uh, uh, developing new ideas and new approaches. More and more we're starting to think in terms of adaptation. And adaptation meaning that, of course, many of the more severe impacts of climate change cannot be prevented at this point. The next few decades will not be about how do we stop this from happening, but how do we react fast enough that while we try to mitigate, at the same time we also try to adapt to the reality of an underlying uh, uh, transformation in our everyday reality. This is a project developed by design fiction studio uh, Superflux, maybe one of the most well-known examples of people working in design in speculative design futures. And it's a project called Mitigation and Shock, in which they develop one full apartment uh, in a planet, in a speculative future in 2050, where food insecurity is a big problem, where we cannot rely on the big networks of food distribution that we used to have before. So the planet has to work around the uh, a scenario of increasing the size of our food security system. So in this project they imagine a scenario where half of the house of every person, half of every apartment is devoted to a self-sustaining farm uh, developed with hydroponics uh, or actually a specific variety of hydroponics called fog ponics where uh, pulverized water is used to make different species growing. Uh, and the goal of an exercise like this one is not really to think about in terms of uh, will this solve our problems, but to try to give shape to features where we look at how other ways of living are possible, how there is nothing natural by the way in which we live today when we can find a tomato uh, 365 days a year, uh, 24 hours a day, in a city like Barcelona probably walking no more than 300 meters. Uh, no previous generation to us has lived this way before. We live in a completely different relation in terms with seasons, with time and the way that, that we ate. So there's no reason of saying that we're gonna keep on thinking or living under this paradigm. So we have to be able to think or articulate how other features look like. And one of the big reasons why we need to think in terms of scenarios of adaptation of course, it's going to be because one of the biggest crises that we're going to have to face is the migration crisis. Whatever we know about the future, about the 21st century, we know it's going to be a century of refugees. Uh, it's going to be a century of displacement of hundreds of millions of people having to leave their natural uh, environments because they become very hard to uh, resist. And not only people, also non-humans, we actually will have to start the process of migrating species from one part of the planet to another. Uh, if we want to preserve those species and let them go extinct. So any kind of a scenario of adaptation includes a world in which we have to adapt people all the time to different circumstances. Whatever happens, and this is where we wanted to finish today, we need to think in terms of a new form of relationship with nature. The paradigm in which we have existed for the last 150 years is basically the one that we call extractivism. And the idea of extractivism is that we were operating under a few paradigms. One was that we could take as many natural resources as we wanted and they would be infinite. So we didn't need to think about how many of them were left. 
that is over forever. We have basically emptied the bank, there are no more savings anymore, there is no more space in the planet to produce uh, fertility that we need to grow our food, the cleaner that we need to, to breathe uh, in a healthy way under our current form of living. So we know that the age of extractivism in which we were just taking and actually uh, sending the waste back to the system uh, thinking that someone would take care of it is just not sustainable anymore, so that age is over. So how do we start to think about new packs with nature, how this would look like, how would it start to define the way that we live? This is a second project I wanted to present by artist Thomas Araceno. This is his series of work called Erosin, and in this series of projects he imagines uh, a form of transportation through the planet using one basic simple fact of physics, which is that warm air is lighter than cold air. So if you take the sun, you take a balloon and you let just the light of the sun heat up the air inside of the balloon, the balloon will rise. So here you have a floating structure that can float in the air without using no single form of energy. So Saraceno imagines that these floating structures will be able to move throughout the planet using the winds, the force of the winds and the directions of the winds as the only force that propelling them through the air. So of course this is a poetic image. It's not that we are going to replace on a short term uh, airplanes with uh, zero emissions floating uh, uh, flying structures. But it's a shape of imagining how that future could start looking like where instead of living under the paradigm of extractivism, living one in which we exist with balance with the endless natural resources of the planet and the energy of the sun. This is another beautiful project by Daisy Ginsburg. In this project what she did was trying to think not only in terms of extinction, but in recovery and in paying in a way homage and tribute to what we've lost by trying to recall it back. This is a project called Resurrecting the Sublime. And in this project, what she was trying to do is recover the smell of the flower from an extinct tree. So using synthetic biology, she could extract DNA from one of the preserved leaves from a species of tree that disappeared at the beginning of the 20th century, and then trying to recover uh, the uh, genetic structure of the plant to produce the flower and then trying to imagine how the smell would have been like. Now, this is not a science fiction exercise. We can do some of it through synthetic biology, but we cannot recover the full plant. But there is something of the relationship that we establish with the past that we've lost by trying to recognize its existence and trying to think in ways in which we incorporate it in a future not only of extinction, but also of de-extinction, of recovering our relationship with the rest of the species in the planet. This is very much influenced by the thinking of philosophers like Donna Haraway, which you could almost think about as one of the most influent thinkers of our time. And in her body of work, what Donna Haraway has been highlighting is that humans are vulnerable and are only able to exist because they exist in an interdependence with other species in the planet. That we exist in direct relationship with insects, with the trees, that make the earth that we breathe breathable, with the bacteria in our stomach, with the bacteria that make the soil fertile so that plants can grow. The paradigm that man is different to the rest of the species is over, as we realize that the only way that we can exist in the future was to rethinking our relationship with all these species in the planet, going from one of supposed supremacy to one of recognized interdependence. In this way, for instance, other thinkers like Judith Butler say, that the defining factor of our age will not have to be equality, the fact that all humans are equal to each other and have the same rights, but interdependence, the recognition that all humans are dependent on each other and dependent with non-humans in multiple diverse ways. That we exist in what is called assemblages of species where knowing where do you start and where the next species uh, ends is not so easy sometimes that we all exist in what is called a hollow beyond, which is an organism made of organisms. So the old paradigm was one with men, especially males, especially white males over all of the rest of humans and non-human beings on the planet to one in which we understand their connection. This is the end of uh, anthropocentrism and we cannot solve the problems of the Anthropocene without recognizing that anthropocentrism cannot be the way in which we think about the planet, and that other beings 
have also complex emotions, that there's not only one way of existing in the planet because there are at least nine million species in the planet and each of them have their own world. Finally, we'll have to think in bigger geological scales. We have to think that we don't only exist in these capsules of time, which is the lifetime of one single human, but actually what we do will determine the life of the planet in different ways. So we need to start thinking more and more in what is called the paradigm of long-termism, way beyond the scopes and the scales of the age of a human being and more in the scope of the age of the planet. So for the last few years, the Lone Now Foundation has been building this structure, which is a clock that will be able to correctly give the time for the next 10,000 years. And of course, it's supposed to be a symbol, but it's an important symbol. Imagine that we can do things that will outlast us as a generation for many, many millennia to come. And that we can think in the scale of the 10,000 years, we may be able to think about solving some of our main problems through that paradigm. Rachel Sussman has been photographing some of the oldest living things in the world, uh, from colonia of mushrooms to a centenarian millennial trees that existed for way longer than we did. And artists like Katie Patterson has also been working uh, in one beautiful huge project called the Future Library, in which she uh, plants a forest and commissions writers to write short stories for this forest. But those stories will only be printed once the trees have uh, grown and then are uh, cut back and thrown into paper. So the, the stories are, are being written by the writers at the same time that these trees are growing. So it's a library for the future, in a way. In the last two years, a revolution has taken place in a way. And this revolution has been recognizing that future generations have political rights, that our obligations as humans do not end with in our lifespans, and that the obligations of politicians go way beyond the life scales in which we exist. And this is, in a way, what Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for Future movement have been saying. We have to stop thinking and acting in terms of the scales of the now, because what we do will determine the lives of generations and generations to come. And these people and non-people, these humans and non-humans, even if they cannot vote, are so directly affected by the political process that we have to imagine a political process where their voices are present where their voices count. And this is one of the biggest challenges and uh, or of our generation. It's one of the biggest transformations that we'll have to face in the coming years. And it's an incredible paradigm to think in terms of design and reimagining the systems of our planet. So in every lecture, we're gonna end thinking about a series of weak signals. That is, things that have been happening that help us to think in terms of design and deal with interventions, spaces of research, that help us to develop further our work from the point of this lecture. So what are relevant, what are important weak signals to think in terms of the planetary crisis? Here are six of them, and you can work with them, you can look deeper into them, you can investigate them to fine tune your work and to keep on developing your research. One would be what we call climate conscience. And climate conscience is the idea of how do we make our everyday life more aware of this set of facts. When we think about the truth, how can we make people more aware that this is something that impacts them every day? How, how can we convince them to adapt their behavior, to incorporate in their life the existence of this uh, huge process that changes everything? The second would be what we call interspecies solidarity. How do we think to take decisions, to design systems, and to imagine interventions that do not only include the priorities of humans, but also the priorities of non-humans? Even better, how do we design systems in which humans and non-humans cooperate to help each other? Long-termism, which is how do we think in time scales that go beyond the time scales of the human life? How do we think in planetary uh, scales. How do we develop interventions that allows us to think in those uh, bigger uh, time spans? Carbon neutral lifestyles. How do we imagine a life in which we are not producing CO2 emissions, in which we uh, take out as much CO2 from the atmosphere as the one that we produce? And then fighting 
concepts and conflicts of the Anthropocene. How do we approach some of the biggest conflicts that will arise in the next few years, like the migration crisis, like plastic, like uh, air quality, all of these like extinction, all of these factors that have been produced and that are going to change the shape of the planet in which we live and that cannot be solved. They can only be approached and incorporated in the way that we imagine uh, our decisions in the years to come.